Welcome everybody. Gonna let everybody come on in. I see the attendee list going up. So I'm gonna just give it a moment as it takes, this takes a few minutes for everybody to get into what I like to call Zoom land. We are expecting a fairly good crowd today. So I am going to just wait about 20 seconds or so. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. For those that have been with us before, um, you know the drill, go find the chat box. For those of you that are new, we do like to do introductions. Um, click on your menu and you will find a chat box. And what we would like you to do is to introduce yourself, first name, where you're from. I unfortunately, because I am in presenter mode, I have trouble pulling up my chat. So John, if you see people introducing yourselves, can you let me know who's here? <laughs> Until I, I will, so down. far, yeah, we've got, so far, wow, Sage from, from Maine, Lily from Vermont, Jack from Montpelier, Corey from Burlington, Montpelier, or Vermont, uh, Sage again, hi Amy, South Hero, Grace Richmond, oh, now they're coming in. Yeah, Isabel Fast and Furious. Isabel from Minnesota, uh, Grace from Essex, Haley from Maine, nice, so oh, I, now I can't keep up. Jazz yeah. So I want to welcome everybody. Remind, um, remind everyone, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator here at UVM Extension. And one of the programs that I run are teen science cafes. And ever since we have been um, changing things up because of coronavirus, we have been doing virtual cafes. So we're really glad that you all are joining us today for our Summer of Science series, which is an eight week series of science cafes. We'll let you know that I'm already thinking about the fall. We're gonna keep these up. So I uh, think you can you kind of think about topics you guys might be interested in for the fall because I'm gonna be reaching out to you all soon. What I wanna remind everyone is this, if you need closed captioning, as soon as I can get into the chat, I'm gonna put, you can see at the bottom of this slide here, there is a link. If you need our live captioning services, those will be available today. While we are in our virtual meeting, we ask that everyone stay muted. You actually all are muted. You don't actually have the ability to speak today. Um, and also myself and our presenter, John, are the only ones showing up on video. So the way we're gonna to communicate today is through the chat box and the Q&A box. And those are both options in, on your menu. The chat box we use to share your thoughts or answer any questions that the presenter might have for you. It's really meant um, as a tool to stay on topic. It's not meant for side conversation. Um, and so over the summer, everyone's been great with using the chat box appropriately. So I thank you for that. I do monitor it. So just remember, chat box is um, really comments, thoughts, answering questions related to the topic. The Q&A box we use specifically for questions that you have for our presenter. So if you have something you want to ask John today about the topic, something he's talked about, or even just learning about his education and how he got to be a professor in his field, that's what you would put in the Q&A box. And there's this really cool feature in the Q&A box called upvoting. So if someone asks a question that you are gonna ask, or even if you just like a question someone else asks, you can click on the thumbs up and that upvotes the question, actually moves it up the rank. So we know that there's a lot of people interested in it. But just know, we actually answer every single question that gets asked. That's one of the key features of our science cafes. We want to make sure that the questions you have get answered. So we will not leave any question today unanswered. Um, we ask that you be, be courteous and respectful today. So just make sure you don't create any distractions. Again, the only thing that's really going to create a distraction is the chat box. So I just say again, use it appropriately. And we ask that you stay engaged and participate fully in today's cafe. I know it's going to be a pretty cool presentation. So I wanna remind you all, as I've said, the Summer of Science is a eight week series. So we have three more cafes after today. 
Next week's cafe is on brain cells. We have a presenter talking about her research with glial cells. And I think, again, it's going to be really um, interesting learning about um, cells and things like um, how, you know, as it relates to epilepsy, I believe that's what the researchers work looking into that disease. So make sure you sign up for next week as well as the other sessions. We end on August 12th will be our last session of Summer of Science. And we just added a quarantine time. It's a special one because we haven't been doing these over the summer. We were taking a break, but a really neat opportunity has come up that we want to share. Um, there's a grant um, and 4-H is working with the College of Engineering and Math and Science at UVM to really broaden and expand the FIRST Robotics program, which is um, participating in robotics competitions and learning um, how to program robots. And we're looking for teens to become ambassadors of that program, to really grow that program around the state. So there's a session on Monday that's gonna be talking about what that involves and how you can become a FIRST Robotics ambassador. So if any of you are interested, go to the link that's right on the bottom of the screen, find quarantine time in the menu, and then you'll see the registration information. You also can just reach out to me if you have trouble finding it. So hopefully some of you out there will be interested in doing this. So I wanna move on to our presentation today. This one's exciting. Topic today is a different kind of veterinarian, veterinary infectious disease epidemiology and One Health. And our presenter today is Professor John Barlow. I'm gonna just read you um, John's bio. Uh, a veterinary infectious disease researcher, John Barlow is an associate professor in the Department of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at the University of Vermont. Initially trained as a veterinarian, Dr. Barlow's research training is in the area of infectious disease epidemiology. With this background, Dr. Barlow sees a critical need to strengthen infectious disease surveillance, laboratory capacity, and basic and applied research targeting pathogens that can be transmitted between humans and animals, zoonotic pathogens. John received a BS in pathobiology from the University of Connecticut, a doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Illinois, and a PhD in infectious disease mathematical and molecular epidemiology from the University of Vermont. His research focuses on dairy cattle health, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and zoonotic diseases. So I would like us all to welcome Dr. John Barlow. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is great. Um, so uh, with that, I'll do a little bit more of a visual introduction and tell you that, yep, I've been in school for a long time. Um, uh, most of my life, although I did practice veterinary medicine um, as a practitioner in a clinic for a period of time. Um, but I grew up in Northeast Connecticut, um, spent some time doing undergraduate in Vermont, went back to Connecticut for more undergraduate went out to the University of Illinois to get my um, veterinary degree, then came back to Vermont and practiced in Virgens, in, um, in a small practice in Virgens that did everything, small animal, dogs, cats, cows, horses. And my wife is also a veterinarian. We met in undergraduate in Connecticut, and we both went to the University of Illinois, and she also was in that practice in Virgens. And now she's still in practice, but I'm an academic veterinarian. I work, um, uh, at the university doing research and teaching. And this list is a list that I hope you'll develop too. It's a list of people who are important in my lifetime, in my career, and my development, my professional development. Some of them are veterinarians, some of them are biologists, um, a number of them are, all of them, many of them are either DBMs or PhDs or DBM PhDs. And there are the people that were really important to me, helping me develop as a scientist. So they're my mentors. So, topics for today. The first thing, we'll talk about contagious disease transmission from a population perspective. So you've already had a couple present presenters that talked about contagious disease transmission. For example, um, Dr. Dubier um, talked about uh, aerosol transmission. So if some of you saw that, that was an awesome presentation. I watched that one too. And then the second thing we'll talk about is zoonotic disease. 
Um, and specifically, I'll talk a little bit about bats and rabies and dogs and rabies and that sort of thing. And finally, we'll finish off talking about One Health or the interaction between um, animal health, human health, and environment and the relationship between emerging diseases and biodiversity and what we're going through right now related to the COVID pandemic. So in the time, if there's time at the end, we can talk a little bit about my, uh, what I do specifically in my research lab. But the first three things are actually um, pretty important, I think. So contagious disease spreads in population. So pretend this um, cartoon or figure is a group of people or other animals. It could be a group of cows. If it was my research, it would be a group of cows. But let's say it's a group of people. And each individual is represented in a circle. And in modeling, we call those circles nodes, actually. And the connections between those people are represented by lines. And then modeling, we call those edges. So the member of this group, which we can call a population, are all connected to each other. And they create a network of connection through those edges. And we're going to explore what happens when you introduce an infectious disease into this population using a game called VAX that's online. And you can actually go to this website that I've got at the top and play VAX yourself. And briefly, I'll play it a little bit to give you a demo. Um, but it's freely available and um, you can work up the uh, levels and see how you do in controlling disease outbreaks. So in this population, there's 50 individuals and they're all, they all have a connection to at least three other people. Some people or the circles or nodes are represented by smaller circles and other ones are represented by bigger circles. So you can kind of see that here. There's a big circle, there's a pretty big circle, there's a small circle, small circle. So in your chat box, what does the size of the circle represent? And I'm, I need to get my chat box up so I can watch you guys. Um, I can't see where I get it. Oh, so while you guys are chatting, make sure um, this is part of the engagement and there is always a delay, John, as you saw with the introduction. So yes, sure. will, they'll all come fast and furious. So hopefully you guys are typing, what do you think the size of the circle represents? Uh, my access to the chat might be covered. Okay, I have it. So Catherine says number of connections, contacts. Totally. That's Katie it. says cases. Yep, number of connections is it. And like, so for example, if I count correctly, Sam here, let's call this dot Sam. Sam's got, I think, uh, seven, seven various connections. So we can count seven edges or lines coming off of her node. Versus Sue, well, Sue's easier to count. One, two, three, four, five, six. She's got six connections in the network. And then Liz down here, she's got three connections in the network. Um, sometimes it's hard to see the connections in the way this model presents. So Tim actually has four connections and Eli also has four connections, but Ed only has three because this line doesn't go, Ed's line, Ed's only got one line to Tim there. The line goes under Tim to Eli. So anyway, um, it represents the size of their connections. So for the spread of a disease or transmission of disease, um, a contagious disease in a network, the connections represent the potential routes that they can spread. So if Sam gets sick, all of Sam's connections are at risk for getting sick. Whereas if Sam's the only one in the population that's sick, Liz has a pretty low risk of getting sick until somebody close to Liz gets sick. So um, that's just, generally on how people are networked or connected to spread a contagious disease. So what does it mean for a disease to be contagious? You can try that in the chat box too. So Lila says it is spread easily. Good, yep. Uh, so, and what, is, and what do you mean Lila when you say it's spread? And I'll add if anyone wants to help Lila out. Yeah. You guys can keep adding to this. So, so Lily says it can be spread. It is active in the virus. Yeah. So, so this is good. So, um, contagious diseases are, uh, and you guys probably know this, but it's hard to um, hard to sort of communicate it. It's, think of the words for it. Contagious are diseases that those are spread between individuals, from like an infected individual to a susceptible individual. There are some diseases out there that are infectious but they're not contagious. In other words, if you get the disease, well, let's say tetanus or botulism or something like that. If you get that disease, you actually don't have a risk of giving that disease to another person necessarily. 
Whereas there's some diseases like COVID, for, for example, today, or influenza, where if you have that disease, you become a source of infections for the other, other individuals who would be susceptible to disease and the population. So you can see the difference between what would be described as an infectious disease. You can get, acquire that infection from some source, might be the ground or your food, or, or even another person, because all contagious diseases are infectious. But contagious diseases are a subset of those infectious diseases, kind of like squares and rectangles type of thing, right? And so contagious diseases are the ones that are spread between individuals. Um, and, um, and so now we can think about, for the game vax, how we control those diseases. So what are some ways that you can control con the spread of contagious diseases in populations? And we're doing some of them today. So you probably have a pretty good sense in terms of preventing COVID spread. And there's a hint there. The name of the game is called Vax. So in the chat box. So Catherine says no connections. Madeline says limiting contact. Yep, so isolation and quarantine. Very good, limiting contacts, yep. And Who else has ideas of, oh, Catherine says vaccines, and so does Grace. Haley yep, so says washing hands. Absolutely. Hygiene is really good, and that reduces transmission potential. Vaccines are really good. And unfortunately for COVID right now, we don't have a, a, value, a vaccine that works, an efficacious or effective vaccine that works right now. Um, uh, for other diseases, we do have some vaccines that work really well or work pretty well. Some years, influenza vaccine works really well, and we all get, many of us in the population get protected from influenza, which reduces its possibility for spread. So in this game, you can actually um, model the effect of vaccination and quarantine um, in the transmission network. And, and what we have is the opportunity to vaccinate individuals and change the whole network. And the game, because the game assumes that a vaccinated person is, is no, can no longer contribute to, um, to uh, the spread of the disease. In the real world, effective vaccines are, um, the eff that effect of the vaccine not contributing to the spread is a pretty good assumption. And we'll see that with an example for rabies later. So I decided to vaccinate a person, um, Tim, and I just wanted to do Tim so we could avoid this confusion of the network there. Um, and so Tim is no longer part of the network. And you could see how it reduced the connectivity between Ed and Eli to just one edge now, and Tim is out of the network. We, I've labeled the remaining five people, and unfortunately, we only have three vaccines left. So in the poll now, vote for you th who you think we should vaccinate next. Who's the best choice to vaccinate to limit the network connectivity and size? So I've just launched the poll. You can vote for who you think should be vaccinated next. If for some reason you don't see this poll, you can just put your answer in the chat box. Oh, nice job, you guys. This is great. Yeah, there's a good reason to vaccinate Eli too. Sam is winning out right now, for sure. Um, and there's another good reason to vaccinate Eli, and we can talk about that. Maybe Eli's your friend. Eli's my son, so I'm not very, so I would vaccinate Eli for sure. But, all right, um, that looks all great. All right, so it looks like the majority, over 71%, because a few in the chat box also voted for Sam. Um, nice. Sam. And that makes sense, right? Because Sam's got all these connections. Now, Eli's not a bad choice too, because Eli, if you vaccinate Eli, you break this bond between this big part of the population and this part of the population. And so that's not a bad choice, but I decided to vaccinate um, Sam. And that's what the network changes to, to look like with Tim and Sam now out of the network because they're protected. And also now with Sue out of the network. Oh, did I skip one? Did I give you a chance to vote again? No, no, that's right. So. And then the, if you pick Sue, because Sue had the next highest level of connections in the network, um, or one of the individuals, then you can change the network again. And I also decided to vaccinate Eli. And, and um, maybe not the best choice of options, because maybe one of these bigger 
high, more highly connected individuals would have been a better choice in the network. But like I said, Eli's my son, so he gets the vaccine, and I get to, I get to um, be the decider on that one. So um, now, this is what the network network looks like after you've used up all your vaccines, and the first infection, the red circle, emerges in the population. And now in the game, you have the option to quarantine individuals within the network. And quarantine is different from isolation. You might hear both terms in the news and the literature. Isolation is what you do for an infected individual. So if you find a person who has the infection, you isolate them from the population. Quarantine is what you do for the people at high risk for infection from the um, infected individuals. So, so if you wanted to quarantine um, an individual, who would be a good person to quarantine um, within the network. If we chose between Kate or Don, what, who would you vote for, for um, quarantining to isolate these people that are connected to the infected individual and, and isolate them from the population? And there's no right choice on these answers and that sort of thing. Um, so, but everybody's going for Kate and, and it kind of makes sense and you could type in the chat box if you want to why you would do Kate but for me it's because Kate has such a high connectivity in the network compared to Don and if we quarantine her we have the potential to limit the, um, the uh, uh, spread of the disease to the rest of the po that larger portion of the population in the network. So nice job you guys. I picked Kate too and so in my next slide um, my next slide, this is what the network now looks like with Kate removed from quarantine and we reduced that connectivity in the network and, and but Don, we left Don at risk and unfortunately he became infected so the disease spread. If we remove the other Tim, which uh, uh, that would be a really good decision, but then the network, we have the potential, we, we, if we remove this other Tim, we have the potential to reduce the spread into this large portion of the network, but the disease can still spread through this, through this connectivity. And then there's this person here too, who's at risk. And so I removed Tim, and that seemed like a good decision, but we resulted in another infection. And the whole game goes through that, whereas you can do this in a stepwise process, and you can see how good you can do in terms of doing the, reducing the number of infections in the population. And so my last decision to to, uh, oops, sorry, to um, pick between Frank or Frankie about who to quarantine. It's a flip of the coin because they both have the same connectivity to the infected individual. My last decision, I think I picked Frankie. And so that left Frank and, and, and that left the infection and then I went on and, and disconnected um, another person, but then the disease spread the other way to Bob. And so you can see, you, 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 we did pretty, I did pretty good by making, and we did pretty good, by making good strategic decisions on vaccination and quarantine, we protected at least 92% of the population. Um, so I think the number is uh, uh, what would that be? Like, uh, 46 out of the, yeah, um, 46 out of the 50, because only four people um, got infected. I was trying to do math the hard way by do 92% of 50, when I could have just looked at four. Anyway, so anyway, so um, if in comparison, if I had made poor decisions and run that model the other way, we could expect a large number. So I made really bad decisions when I did this one and just randomly quarantined people that weren't connected and vaccinated people only on the fringe and that sort of thing. And you can see what size of the population um, got infected. So now, um, this is where the game is, and I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share my browser and show you the game and um, show you what you can play this at home if you want to. Um, and I'll um, do it oh so briefly um, so that we can get back to, um, oops, hold on, to zoonotic disease. Okay, so when you go in and you follow that website, um, this is what, the game, what you'll come to. Um, and there's different levels and there's um, degrees. 
the high degree is the size of the circle. So you could play this game without knowing the size of the circle. You still see the edges, but you don't get that visual clue of the size of the circle, of the size of the circle. And then the quarantine phase, you can do this in either real time or turn based. The turn based is it allows you to make, so start with turn based. It allows you to make a decision and then the infection spreads. In the real time, the infection is spreading in real time as you're making decisions. So just to show you, let's do it in real time and we'll hide degree. And I'll pick um, doing it from medium. And so there's the network. I get seven vaccines. So I'm just gonna go quick and not put a lot of thought into who I'm vaccinating, but I'm gonna try and you can argue with me and say that was a bad decision. And you're probably right, but I'm gonna just try to pick some people to vaccinate. Oh, and now the infection spread and this is in real time. So I'm gonna start quarantining people. And oh, now it's going and I'm, I'm already lost. I'm behind, oh no. So I, right, so, so see, like this is, okay. I gotta be a lot faster than that. Oh, 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 there we go. So how did I do? So you can submit the game. You can see how you did. And I only saved or whatever, I protected 15% of the people. So anyway, this game is out there on the web for you to play and for you to mess around with and see how you can do and see how you do best and that sort of thing. Um, so let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll go to um, zoonotic diseases. You can ask any questions while we're going right now. Um, and I'll... Uh, um, yeah, you guys remember to use the Q&A box. Um, but any questions that pop up, just start putting them in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll take them as we move through. All right. Uh, oops. Okay, here we are back in the presentation. I can show you this was the, um, there we are in the game. I, I, there was one other thing to talk about that's potentially important and that's herd immunity. And so you might hear that in the news today talking about herd immunity in the face of COVID and what that means. And what that means is protecting a good portion of the population, um, for example, with vaccination. So if a lot of the people in the population, let's say 80% or 60%, in this case, it's pretty close to 80% um, or it's pretty close to 90%, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, pretty close to 80% um, because there's 50 people. If a lot of people in this population of, let's say, in this case, dogs, there was a dog named Mr. Kitty, by the way. I don't know why. These are client, these are um, uh, protecting the innocent, but uh, these are names of client, dogs for my wife's clients. I asked her for a list of names. So anyways, we particularly like Patrick Swayze. But anyway, so, so anyway, if you get a lot of that animals in the population vaccinated, then when a, a disease is introduced to, for example, a susceptible individual, like a dog that hasn't been vaccinated for rabies, let's say, is introduced in the population, the rest of the population is no law, is protected, and, and so the network is broken up. So even the unvaccinated animals, other unvaccinated animals in the population have some level of protection. So that's what herd immunity is about, that you'll probably hear about today as we start to get better at knowing, uh, at developing a COVID vaccine, um, then the issue of herd immunity to prevent, um, to get a good enough coverage of the vaccine, so a large swath, a proportion of the population is protected from and reduces the risk of disease transmission in that population. And that's explained in the game too on a later set of modules. But um, this game was made by a PhD student at the University of Penn, or, um, at Penn State University, um, really great lab and um, at, on infectious disease at Penn State. And that student and the investigator in that lab have both moved on. So they haven't updated, they didn't um, extend the game where they thought they would go with a herd immunity module that would allow you to explain vaccine, explore vaccine coverage. Anyway, okay, zoonotic diseases, uh, transition. So zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transmitted between animal, humans and other animals. And I say between because that is important. 
Some people say zoonotic diseases are ones that are transmitted from animals to humans, but it's not really true. Um, I like to be more broad and think about um, uh, there are some diseases um, that humans actually transmit to animals. And so, um, so I use, I sort of use a more encompassing approach to think about zoonotic diseases. But you're probably most familiar with some zoonotic diseases that we can catch or get from animals. So in the chat box, can you name some zoonotic diseases? Uh, Jasmine says rabies. Uh, Catherine says COVID-19. Lila also put in rabies. Excellent. And Haley says ringworm. And Jasmine <laughs> says swine flu. Lily said, or yeah, uh, Lily guys, says flu. You guys. Uh, Madeline, good. anthrax. Uh, KL says MERS. Really good. You guys are really good. Okay. All right. Let's do rabies because that's the one I'm prepared for. Um, and so um, zoonotic disease is associated with this species, and you probably already know it. Rabies is one answer, but can you think of any other diseases that are zoonotic that might be associated with these species? Somebody, you, did, you did some already. Um, somebody said COVID, which is actually the SARS virus. So um, if you wanna type some things in the chat box, that's great. The first SARS virus, that's definitely been associated with um, emergence from bats. This current SARS virus, COVID-19, we're not so sure yet, um, but um, it's likely, it's pretty likely that the original reservoir, the animal host species that the virus um, was in originally, yeah, um, is bats. And then rabies um, is a bat, potentially carried by bats as well. Raccoons, um, we have a serious problem or issue with raccoon rabies in the Northeast. Um, so most of you um, who might be so let's talk about rabies. This is a, a slide that I got from a review paper um, that I modified a little bit to talk about rabies. You might not realize this, but um, rabies causes between 50 and 60,000 deaths globally a year. So 50, human deaths. So 50 to 60,000 people um, a year die from rabies, which is an amazing number. Um, and most of those deaths occur in either Africa or Asia. And the most common source of rabies infections in humans for people that die from rabies in the world is, is spillovers or um, bites, um, bites from dogs. And so people in um, Africa and Asia keep dogs sort of differently than we do. Many dogs are, are outside, free roaming, and they have contact with wildlife uh, more readily than our dogs. And the other thing is mass vaccination of dogs in those regions is less common, although there's programs to develop improved vaccination coverage of the dog population. So in the US or North America, um, Canada, US, and, and some and other parts of North America, um, we do a really good job. It's a huge veterinary public health service to vaccinate our dogs and cats. And that has resulted in we no longer are at risk for the most part for rabies exposure from our pet populations because of that public health service. So veterinarians acting as public health professionals to reduce rabies transmission um, to humans by protecting our pet population. So it's not only good for to protect the animals, it's a public health issue to protect humans as well. Rabies vaccine, vaccination is, is a good example of a vaccine, a successful vaccine program that's reduced our risk and exposure to rabies. In fact, the last decade or so, there's only been about a, a, few, a little over 100, uh, closer to 200 cases, last couple of decades, um, and the last decade, about 100 cases or so of rabies exposures in humans. And some of those rabies exposures are due to exposure to wildlife populations. Because in, the, in North America, we still have a series, uh, we still have rabies circulating in wildlife populations. So this is a map from the CDC that shows the distribution of rabies virus in different populations and rabies and their reservoir species. And so in the, in the east and northeast, the raccoon is the dominant reservoir species for spread of rabies in wildlife populations. Across the whole US, you can see this hash mark covers all of the US, bat populations will carry rabies. 
In the Midwest, it's skunks. In the Southeast, it's foxes and raccoons or foxes and skunks. Um, and so these different regions, in, in Puerto Rico, it's mongoose, it's the mongoose population. So these different regions have dominant species that are associated with rabies transmission. In the Northeast, in my lifetime, we've seen a spread of rabies northward in the Northeast uh, and of raccoon rabies. And so raccoon rabies is now in, in our area dom is uh, endemic or present in the population. But when I was your age, um, it, w it was slowly moving up the East Coast. And right now, a number of agencies have some programs to vaccinate wildlife to prevent the continued spread of rabies. So they use these vaccines that are baits, they're oral vaccines, and they have a, a virus in them that has been genetically engineered to have, um, an to ex to have antigens or protein, express proteins from the rabies virus so that when a raccoon these are stinky fish oil emulsion coated vaccine capsules. The raccoon finds this because of their scent, bites into it, the capsule bursts in their mouth, and they get exposed to this vaccinia virus, not a rabies virus, that causes, that doesn't cause any health problems or disease in them, but they're exposed to this virus that also has been genetically engineered to carry the ra some rabies capsid surface proteins that drive an immune response to the rabies virus. So this genetically engineered vaccinia virus vaccine Im immunizes raccoons to the rabies virus and it prevents, it pr protects raccoons from getting rabies from unvaccinated rabies infect, other unvaccinated rabies infected raccoons. It's a really cool program. As you get older and you're available, like in college or something like that, there's opportunities to volunteer for the bait drops. They drop these baits by airplanes or in hand, in urban, by hand in urban areas or by helicopter someplace all across the Northeastern Canadian border from Maine to New York to immunize the raccoon population to prevent raccoon rabies from spreading northward into Quebec. Right now, Quebec has rabies, but it's mostly in foxes, um, and they are geographically somewhat isolated and don't spread down. And so we're trying to inter -age, internationally control the spread of rabies across, um, across uh, North America, Northeast US and, and Canada. Really interesting. All right, last topic, we'll switch to um, One Health and Emergence Infectious Disease. So I'm gonna show you three pictures and they are um, a change in, in uh, they'll change over time. And in the chat box, I want you to tell, sort of type what you see in the changes, and then we'll talk about that, how that might affect or impact um, infectious disease and emergence. How are we doing on time, Lauren? Oh, you got plenty, you're good. Oh, good, all right, good. Okay, so here's your series of pictures, guys, folks. All right, what do you deserve in this series of contracts? cartoons, and type your answers in the chat box. I can go back if you like. So there's where the system started. There's some changes in the system now. So what are you seeing? Lila says different animals. Yep, introduction to, di oh, great, really good. Introduction to different animals. So we got some domestic animals. Okay, Madeline says livestock. Uh, Catherine says introduction of domesticated animals. Jasmine Excellent. says there are more people. KL Increase says humans are moving in. Yep. Haley says we murdered the forest. Yeah. Also <laughs> says less trees. Lily <laughs> says more animals are getting added and then humans are getting introduced. Catherine yeah. says concentrated wildlife population and Sage says bats. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's really good. So um, all of those are right on. We have this um, uh, movement of human populations into uh, previously, um, uh, previously wild areas or, 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 or forested areas that are 
if you will, ecosystems on their own that are working. And then slowly humans are cutting down the trees and expanding into these populations. And that's resulting, and then they're bringing their domestic animals along. And so now we have these edges between these forests. But as you said, there's a change because now we also have closer, so we have closer interactions on these edges between wildlife species and the domestic animals and humans. And so, and we've changed the ecosystem. So now the available size of the ecosystem for the animals has gotten smaller. And so now we have some animals that are actually coming into our agriculture or urban ecos or um, a suburban or, or um, rural ecosystems where the forests have been removed. And a lot of this stuff is, has been going on for, for centuries and is still going on and is especially going on in um, many developing countries and that sort of, uh, so that sort of idea. So with that, we have reductions in, in the diversity of, of species, the, both the density and diversity of species. And there's this concept in infectious disease ecology um, that's called the dilution effect. And so when you reduce the density and diversity of, of wildlife species in a population, it might allow for um, the concentration or easier spread or transmission of some diseases in the remaining species, that sort of thing. So a good example of that is Lyme disease in, in the Northeast. And there's some evidence from researchers in, in New York State that suggests that as we've changed our ecosystems in the Northeast, it's created environments or, or areas that have allowed for the movement, the increase in the size of the deer population and the movement of the, um, the vector of Lyme disease, which is the exodes tick into those populations and increases in the size and changes of the small mammal population. So increase in the size of, of mice and that sort of thing and potentially loss of those predators of small mammals. There's some evidence that changes in the predator populations reducing the number of foxes and increasing the number of coyotes has contributed a bit to the increased prevalence of some small mammals that actually contribute to the amplification of Lyme disease in those populations. So, and then we're on the edge where we have these tick populations that have been introduced because of the change in the ecology and we're closer to the tick populations. So we get exposed and so as a result of that, that's some of the ecological sort of impacts in the Northeast that we've seen with the emergence of Lyme disease in, as an example. And you've probably all heard of Lyme. So the take home from that is man-made changes like anthropogenic change. So that just means anthro, human, genic, change, or, uh, made. So man-made changes um, like environmental changes or agricultural development or fragmentation of habitats, all can contribute to the emergence of infectious disease. The loss of biological diversity can also contribute to the emergence of infectious disease. And really important, potentially with COVID, the increased contact between humans, domestic animals, and wildlife have, is in continually showing that we are demonstrating that we are um, resulting in, in emergence infectious disease outbreaks. And the three coronavirus outbreaks that we've experienced in the last decade or so are good examples of those that have jumped from wildlife species into either our domestic species, camels from MERS, and those who didn't know there are domesticated camels, which is really interesting, um, or, um, or in the case of um, uh, uh, the other two coronaviruses, uh, the contact between wildlife um, reservoir species and humans in these what's described as wet markets where people because of cultural issue cultural um, preferences uh, uh, um, consume uh, or uh, consume uh, wildlife species and the final thing that's really important in all of this that we've witnessed in both the um, COVID-1 and the SARS COVID um, coronavirus 2 is the connect increased connectivity of human populations so um, there are many recent examples of disease emergence in humans and domestic animals from spillover events. These events where we see a 
movement of a species, a zoonotic disease from one host species to another and um, developing the ability to spread in that second species is described as a spillover event. Hendra virus, Nipah virus, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, which is currently suspected, MERS, some influenza outbreaks, Ebola, HIV is historically a, an animal um, host associated disease that jumped into humans. West Nile virus happened, came, emerged in New York City in 1999. And so the first time it emerged in North America with mosquitoes, that sort of thing. All of these spillover events are probably associated with these factors. And, and it illustrates an important concept. It illustrates, um, so this is just another word cloud of all of the emerging diseases and that sort of thing. And this is a map of a paper from um, Ian Lipkin, who's a really great researcher in these types of areas um, on emerging diseases, recently emerging diseases. So the numbers are, are quite large and, and they continue to happen as we see them. And all of these, oh, one last really thing. We can't blame the bats in all of this, like for the COVID stuff, because bats are really, really, really ecologically important. So. Um, they're important pollinators, they're important insectivores, right? Um, eating insects, that sort of thing. Um, but we can recognize that a lot of these are all about um, this one health type of issue, the relationship between humans, um, animals, and the environment, and the health of humans, the health of animals, and the health of, health of environment. Hendra virus in Australia, if you've heard of that, is a really interesting example of this. Um, you talked about zoonotic disease if you listen to Dr. Whittier's presentation on the gorillas and the potential for humans introducing human respiratory virus into the gorilla populations. All of these things happen because we're increasing our connectivity between um, humans and wildlife, whether we're doing it because of agricultural development and encroachment and reduction of, of the size of ecosystems or we're changing the ecosystem where the bats typically migrate. And, and with Hendra virus, this is an example. Hendra virus is a se severe virus that um, is transmitted from bats to horses. And occasionally people can get really sick from this disease too, um, but um, horses become really sick. And in Australia, this is a, a significant problem. And it has mostly to do because the ecology of the bats um, has changed and they've moved their feeding sites to um, more suburban areas where there are horse populations and they nest in the trees above horse feeding sites and they urinate and defecate and then horse, horses get um, exposed to that virus through their, through their um, excretions, that sort of thing. So just another brief example, we could talk about Nipah virus and bats exposure to people in Malaysia and pigs, um, exposure to that virus, all sort of interesting examples that have happened over the um, last uh, decades or so. So if you're really interested in this, there's a great book for maybe um, high school age, junior in high school, senior in high school by David Kamen, Kamen, um called Spillover. Uh, Spillover Animal Infections and the Next, Next Human Pandemic. And he goes through a whole bunch of stories on, um, on uh, emerging infectious disease that were spillover events like this. Um, so thinking about the material in this presentation, now, if we're thinking from a One Health perspective and we're thinking about ecology and animal health and human health, environmental health, in the chat box, list some professions, specialties, or disciplines, air of expertise, that have the potential role to contribute to these One Health problems, like emerging infectious disease. And you know, One Health issues are more than emerging infectious disease. Everybody learns about One Health issues. I'm talking while you list the chats and the specialties, and maybe as I talk, you can um, think about what I'm saying at the same time, and it might give you an idea about this. People learn about the One Health concept through zoonotic or emerging infectious disease like I'm presenting to you here. But One Health is more than that. It involves, for example, toxicology and environmental pollution, that sort of thing. So it's not just infectious disease. You can think about pollution issues affecting the environment, 
animal populations, human populations, those sorts of things. So um, there's lots of areas that can um, think about different professions contributing to this One Health concept. So what do we got for answers? So far we have nurse, we have public health, we have epidemiologists, we have conservation. Yeah, ecologists for sure. I'll throw one in because it's what my husband does and you wouldn't probably think of it as a water and wastewater operator. Oh yeah, definitely, for sure. Controlling what eventually goes into our waterways. Yep, absolutely. And then there's, you guys have had some presentations. You had a presentation earlier. Well, of course there's veterinarians, but then you had a presentation earlier from a PhD student who's gonna be a virologist. So there's all those specialists like virologists and microbiologists. Biochemist would be important because of all the um, uh, sort of issues associated with uh, chemicals and, and that sort of thing in our environment and understanding the biochemistry of systems. Um, we talked about ecologists briefly. Anything else? James has added farmer. Absolutely. The role of the person right at the uh, sort of interface there. Yep, and decisions that farmers are making for their production systems. So you guys, I know because of talking with Dr. Barlow, but also um, I know my own background. I'm wondering when you say public health, is it just the doctors and people that we think of as scientists or who else is controlling public health? There's a whole other side besides science. Lily says it's everyone. Yeah, it definitely is. This who, do we, who do we elect? when you guys are old enough to vote. So president is one person we vote for. Yes, who else do we vote? Policy makers. Yeah. Yep. Nice. And so, right, governor, Congress. So is it on the national level? Is it, think about local. Who's at your local level that might be making some decisions? Yep, mayor, representatives. Absolutely. And then, I know, depending on where you live, too, um, I'm learning this from watching the news. In Texas, judges have a very important role within local, the local government structure. It's not how we do things in the Northeast, but depending on where you live in the country, different people have, have more or less power in decision making. So someone else puts city council, exactly. That's right. So policymakers are really important and people who do administrative work and government administration and policy are really important in helping us sort of implement these issues and, and figure out how to implement these issues, these things. Um, and then on the social science side, think about um, people like anthropologists who study how people and cultures sort of work and move together and that sort of thing, you know? So social scientists can have a huge role in these One Health issues. So it's not just lab and vet scientists and, and physicians and veterinarians that have um, a role, but um, as you know, it, it, the, it's just everyone needs to have it. John, a I'm gonna argue that um, anyone who's in currently a 4-H club member, your 4-H volunteer leaders have a role in this and your 4-H <laughs> educators. <laughs> yeah, so just like this fellow, William Koresh, who um, works at a place called the Echo Health Alliance. So if you're interested in this topic, you should look up the Echo Health Alliance. Really cool website, great stuff. Um, a lot of work with uh, bat viral diseases in, in Asia and that sort of thing. Just like he says, um, the solutions that we're gonna have for these emerging infectious diseases um, can't be looked at in, in single boxes and everyone is gonna have to work together to, to solve the problems. So I'm not sure where we are in time. You are good with time. We are at 1.54. Um, okay. You guys keep, start thinking about your questions because we're gonna be getting to that part. So if you have a question or you think of something, put it in the Q&A box. But John, you're good with time. Great, perfect. I, I'll just take a couple minutes and tell you a little bit of what I do in my lab. Like I said at the beginning, I, I sort of had a long road to becoming a researcher. Um, I, uh, um, I started, I didn't get into vet school um, or until I was 28. So um, there's plenty of time and no hurry. So I graduated with my veterinary degree at 
the age of 32. Um, and then uh, practiced for a little while and, and worked out um, um, as a, what you would see as a typical veterinarian. Um, a lot of my work was with dairy cattle because uh, uh, it's sort of what I grew up with, um, but um, did the whole everything, mixed dogs, cats. And then, um, and then I realized that really I was um, more destined for wanting to do research. Most of what I did in practice, I would sort of think about what was the research angle and think about studies that we could do to sort of explore something um, with the population. So uh, with the animals, uh, animal population that we were working with. So um, it didn't take long for me to decide to go back to school. So my schooling, if you think about it, after high school was uh, a four year undergraduate's degree and then four years of veterinary school and then five years of my PhD. So it's a long haul to become a, science, a veterinary scientist with a PhD, but it was totally worth it. Um, and now what I work on mostly is um, a bacterial uh, infection in cattle caused by a disease pathogen called stat, uh, a group of pathogens, a genera uh, or genus, a genera of pathogens in the um, Staphylococcus genera. And one of them that you probably are aware of is Staphylococcus aureus and that causes infections in cattle. Um, and we do population level work looking at Staph aureus transmission between cattle. It's a contagious pathogen in cattle, spreads from cow to cow, from an infected cow in pink here to uninfected susceptible cows in the population. And we work on understanding how Staphylococcus um, spreads between cows. But you've also probably heard of Staph aureus in people, and it is the same organism but we think mostly for the most part, different strains of the same organism. So there's a thing that's called host ad adaptation of some pathogens where the Staph aureus species, what we're finding from our research, the Staph aureus species that we find in cows is not necessarily the same ones we find in people. So we've done some work recently with my graduate student, PhD student, Ashma. She's from Nepal originally, and she's a really good microbiologist and she's developing now molecular biology skills. And we do strain typing of the bacteria that we isolate from people on farms and cows on farms. And we do genetic um, typing. Uh, right now we've moved into doing whole genome sequencing of the bacteria to look at the factors that allow the bacteria to survive and propagate in the human host versus what is happening in the, in the cows. And so, one of the things that we also do from those isolates is we follow antibiotic resistance of the staphylococci. And you have probably heard of MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus. Well, that's describing a, a antibiotic resistant that's usually multi-resistant, an antibiotic resistant form of staph aureus. And so we try to understand the staph aureus that we see in cattle and the staph aureus that we see in people, their antibiotic resistance profiles and what leads them to become and carry antibiotic resistance and how that antibiotic resistance might be spreading in the farm systems between people um, as well as between cows and then spilling over from people to cows or vice versa from cows to people. So that's a, just a brief synopsis of some of the work we do in my lab. That's, oh, that's another slide of other things that we're doing. We can talk about later on. That was the antibiotic resistance on, um, on poultry if we need to, but that's okay. So, so, and that's about all I have for today. Um, so I'm happy to um, take- Yes, so John, we, we have two questions, but before we get to the questions, I'm gonna launch a quick poll. We always like a little feedback from our sessions. So I just launched it. There's two questions, answer both of them. And then if you have a question for Dr. Barlow, go to the Q&A box after you've done the poll and put your question in there and, and we'll take questions. Um, you can ask your question anonymously. So, you know, I always say there is no question that shouldn't be asked. If, you, if you're thinking about it, then please put it in the Q&A box because I guarantee you somebody else probably wants to know as well. I know we already have two good ones related to vet school in there. Um, 
but I want everybody to take this poll before we move on to the questions. I'm gonna leave it for about another minute, so just try to answer the poll. I only see about half of you have done it so far. So poll first, then questions. <laughs> Oh, well, I didn't stop showing the screen. Hmm. Oh, I did. So you should still see, hang on, uh, I'm gonna end it and I'm going to, oh, relaunch. Oh, I'm sorry, I, started, I stopped sharing my screen so I could see the question. Okay, hang on you guys, I'm gonna relaunch the poll. And so if everybody's gonna have to go in again, I apologize on that. Can you see it now? And let's just get everybody quickly to answer both questions and then we're gonna to get to the questions that are, that are in the Q&A box. And again, add any that you might have. So I'm gonna to try to get more than 55%. So if you haven't done the poll yet, please do. There is no name attached to it. So this is all anonymous, but this is really important feedback that we use um, as well as reporting that I have to do, but it's not tied to anyone's name. So I'm gonna give it about 30 more seconds. Please go in and take it because there is a bunch of you who haven't yet. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Thank you for those that have taken this. And we do have a couple of questions for you, John. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna start with the, these, there are two of them that are kind of related. So one is how many years were you in school or college and where do you work? Um, related to schooling is, oh, I, I apologize. It's, it, I, I'm gonna leave that one alone. So just how many years were you in school and college? Where do you work? Yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> um, I was in school, uh, um, long, well, um, so four years, well, I had an initial undergraduate degree immediately after high school that I did in three, I completed in three years. Um, and then I worked for a little bit after that. For, so I got a degree in environmental or outdoor education. And I worked for a little bit after that degree. And then I decided to um, go back to school because I decided I wanted to do the veterinary school thing. So um, if you don't count that initial three years and you just talk the trajectory about um, going to vet school and then my PhD, it was four years of undergraduate work and then four years of vet school, so that's eight, and then another five years to complete my PhD, so that would be 13 years of school. But I've been in school and then after my PhD, I stayed in school and I've been working as, a, as either a research associate or a professor so I've been in school for most of my life. Um, where I work is at the University of Vermont. I work in the Department of Animal and Veterinary Science um, as a researcher and teacher there. So I teach classes um, in infectious disease transmission, molecular epidemiology of infectious diseases. And this fall, I'll be teaching our um, anatomy class um, for the undergraduates. Nice. So. Next question, can you tell us about the coronaviruses that affect other mammals, specifically equine coronavirus? All I really know is that it's enteric. Also, any words of advice or wisdom surrounding vet school, what they're looking for and how to navigate specializing in your DVM? Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. So happy to tell you about, let's do the vet school thing first, because that will be easier. And then we'll talk about, um, animal coronaviruses other than the uh, three that have spilled over into humans. Um, uh, well, we'll talk about some human coronaviruses too, actually. But anyway, vet school. Um, uh, 
so what they're looking for, um, they're looking for somebody who can succeed in the curriculum. Um, that school is really expensive for both the student who's applying as well as for the states and institutions where there is a vet school. So they want to accept people into the program who are not going to fail out because of academic issues. So they're looking for people who can be successful in a rigorous medical program that, um, that has a ton of information management and lots to memorize and lots to learn about and try to um, understand. So they're looking for somebody with um, uh, strong interest in, in biological sciences, but doesn't have to be. You could be a history major or an art major or a music major or anything like that and still apply to vet school as long as you have a strong science background. Doesn't really matter if you, you don't have to be a, a necessarily animal science major or a biology major, although those are good really good degrees for um, preparing for veterinary school. Um, and so they're looking for somebody who is um, intellectually uh, um, uh, capable of completing the really rigorous medical pre or medical professional curriculum. And they're also looking for people who understand the profession. So my first, and, um, and here's my biggest piece of advice for any of you thinking about veterinary medicine and veterinary school. Recognize that it's a profession that serves society. So you work with clients, people, that, um, and serve them to keep their animals healthy. Whether it's food animals or companion animals and pets, you work with people to keep them help, help keep their animals healthy. And so they're looking for people who understand what the profession is all about. So the best thing that you could do right now, if you're in high school, um, or even junior high school, is find your local veterinarian and see if you can shadow in a clinic so you can learn a little bit about what it would be like to be a veterinarian, um, to see what that job is really like and how that job works. And you'll probably have to start out, if you're shadowing, by um, just sort of hanging around and watching and then move up to being able to um, work in the kennels and clean cages or something like that. But it's definitely a worthwhile experience to understand what um, happens in a vet clinic and what that profession is all about. Does that help? Oh, and navigating specialization. <laughs> At this point, I wouldn't worry too much about specialization in veterinary practice, although as you do internships, you'll see that there are some people that really like surgery and some people that really like medicine and, and those sorts of things. And it's possible, um, just like in human medicine, to become specialized or boarded um, in various specific specialization. From epidemiology, there's a specialization in epidemiology where you can get your boards to anesthesia, well, it would be from anesthesiology because that's A, um, all the way to zoologic medicine type of thing. Um, so, um, and then radiology and clinical chemistry and all sorts of specialties that you could, after your four year veterinary basic degree, that you could specialize in to um, have a, a, an area of an expertise, sort of like what I did for getting my PhD after my veterinary degree. That answer that? I think that answers that pretty well. Yeah, and so the other part of the question was talking about um, other coronaviruses, oh. specifically yeah. the flying coronavirus. Yeah, so there's a lot of coronaviruses out there. Um, there are a number, a few different pig coronaviruses. There are dog coronaviruses. And as the question asked, there's an equine coronavirus. So there's a lot of species that have um, coronaviruses. So um, knowing that it's enteric, that means it affect the, affects the gut. So um, these uh, coronaviruses, like in pigs and um, horses and in dogs that affect the uh, gut, um, they cause enteric disease like diarrhea, essentially. So, um, so they are um, a host, like I was talking about for the Staph aureus. These coronaviruses are all in the same sort of viral group, um, but they are host adapted. And it's rare that these coronaviruses jump to new species. There's something special about the bat coronaviruses that allow them to jump into, into new host species. And oftentimes there's an intermediate host or an amplifying host 
Like in the first coronavirus, you heard in a previous presentation probably that the civet cat was um, a species that was implicated in its movement from bats to humans. And that's not fully um, understood, but um, it's a good example. Um, so, or in the case where people get MERS, the jump was from, for example, bats to camels to people, that sort of thing. So there's something special about these bat coronaviruses that allow them to adapt and move into a new species. <laughs> Another question I see um, is, uh, what's the most contagious virus in animals? Well, that's debatable, but um, one of them that's really, really highly contagious um, is called foot and mouth disease virus, and it affects cattle and other, um, uh, well, it affects pigs, cattle, um, and, and sheep and goats. And it's, um, it's a virus in the family, you don't need to know this, but um, I'll just show off now. It's the virus in the family of picornaviruses, um, and it, um, uh, it is um, not to be confused with the um, human disease caused, caused, called hand, foot, and mouth disease. It's, and it's not a zoonotic disease. So foot and mouth disease is highly, highly contagious. In fact, there's some evidence that cases, animals with foot and mouth disease um, shed the virus and it spread from France, animals in France with foot and mouth disease shed the virus and it spread across the English, English Channel into England at one time, that sort of thing. So um, it's, it's a highly, it takes very few virus particles to our virions, um, active live infectious virus to cause a new infection in a susceptible animal. And most animals are susceptible because um, it's been controlled in a lot of countries and it's not around. So that's So John, the, there is a question that gets, that kind of asks that, what is the estimated amount of time it would take for a virus to jump species? So when you say quick, like, ah. is that, a day? Is that an hour or is that a month or a year? Yeah, um, I don't think we really know that um, and it's it's probably really hard to estimate. I think that so if we use an example um, there uh, like uh, where something that we um, have uh, used viral genome sequences um, that we can collect today to look at the uh, genetic similarity between one virus and another virus, um, and let's say, and let's use HIV as an example, where um, the current sort of accepted theory is that the simian, so ape, um, uh, immunodeficiency virus, SIV, at some point jumped into a human. And it probably has to do with um, people uh, hunting wild game in their regions, and, and we often describe it as hunting bushmeat. And so um, if you look for online, um, if you look for a, um, a, uh, um, a presentation by uh, Nathan Wolf on exploring the dark matter and viral jumps on um, uh, what's, uh, What's the um, really popular set of, uh, of, uh, of talks that um, technology? TED has, Talks? TED Talks, yeah. If you look for Nathan Wolf's TED Talk on viral emerging diseases, um, you'll get a really good explanation of, of bush hunters and bush meat and looking for spillovers of diseases like uh, viral diseases from one animal to another. But in the case of HIV, it was thought that in the Congo, um, probably at some point, hunters were hunting um, bush meat and um, individual hunters were exposed to uh, the simian immu immunodeficiency virus and became infected. And then it wasn't until, um, so those spillover ha events happened uh, immediately on exposure to the blood of that infected animal or something like that. And the infection event probably happens within the day of the individuals. But it wasn't until social issues and cultural issues changed in those regions 
people started building train lines, populations started um, becoming bigger, the relationship between uh, populations, isolated populations and urban populations, connectivity started increasing. It wasn't until that happened that these individual, multiple probably, SIV spillover events from, from simians, from apes, into people, um, probably associated with bushmeat hunting, um, resulted in uh, uh, connectivity for people for the virus to adapt and evolved in that human host to be transmittable, transmissible between humans, that sort of thing. So um, transmissible between humans. So um, how long does it take? It kind of depends on the population connections and, um, and how readily the virus adapts to the new host. So our last question, I think, is a really good one. Um, thinking about um, everything you've talked about. So Kale asks, how do you balance the natural occurrences of diseases and keeping populations from experiencing them? And with that, I'll say we are getting, uh, you know, very towards the end. So maybe just a minute or two on this. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, a really great question and something for you to, uh, that's an unanswered question at this time in the scientific community. Um, uh, it's, it's a place for you to think about exploring as you, if this interests you, as you become a, a scientist. Uh, one way we do this is um, reduce contact rates. So in the SARS example, if we, can, if we could reduce the amount of time people are exposed to wild animals like bats and bat populations, which is a source of that spillover, then we would reduce the probability of human populations experiencing these spillover events. So understanding our contact rates and the frequency of our contacts and preventing those high risk events is the way to keep human populations from um, experiencing continued outbreaks like this. That's great. Well, I want to let's all thank Dr. Barlow for giving us his time today. Thank you all for joining us again. And, um, you know, I'm sure that if you realize you have a question later on, you all know where Dr. Barlow works. You can track him down at UVM. But uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you all for joining us. And again, Dr. Barlow, thank you so much for your time.